I'm going to continue today on the topic of the Holy Spirit, forgotten God. The Holy Spirit has become a huge emphasis of the church in the last 100 years, ever since the Azusa Street revival and the, the gift of the speaking in tongues and the other gifts of the Holy Spirit that has become active and manifest. The Holy Spirit is not a upgraded life of a Christian. The Holy Spirit is not a life that is deeper of a Christian. Many times we treat the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit as like, you know, sometimes you go to a car wash and then there's the standard car wash, which is the seven bucks. And Tim Bush bumped it to an eight now. And so eight bucks car wash, you know, and then what it does is it supposedly it's really good. But then there's the one for 11 bucks. There's the one for 14 bucks. And then there's the, the ultimate one for 17 bucks. And once I took Ilya's car actually and because I uh, was preparing the car to pick up one of the guest speakers I didn't have to pay with my own money so I decided to use the ultimate car wash and Ilya's car and so um, and it was so ultimate that when I brought it to my house it was leaking oil <laughs> so it washed everything underneath I hope it didn't damage and because I was like this is but I didn't see the difference between the ultimate and the standard I'm just saying this is just the difference in price and just don't tell it to Tim Bush uh, but I didn't see much difference in that except the price in the car wash. It happens in a gas, you go in and there's that, you know, the standard gas and then you pay more, you get a little better gas. It happens in cars, you get a standard version. It doesn't have the seat warmers, it doesn't have the Bluetooth audio, it doesn't have the back camera, it doesn't have all other perks, but you get the upper version and it has a little bit more better of things. And many times we approach the Holy Spirit the same way. We come to church, we get Jesus, you get the standard. Avoid hell. But if you really want to pay a price, meaning if you want to be like those crazy people, you deny yourself of all the things that are good for you like food, like um, other things and you, you avoid and you hide yourself and you pay this price. You get deeper things with God and you get more of the Holy Spirit. Now let me tell you something from the beginning. Holy Spirit has never been for sale. Holy Spirit is not on discount and He's not on clearance. Even if you could pay for the Holy Spirit, you and I wouldn't be able to afford Him. The Holy, there is no such a thing as paying a price to get the Holy Spirit. Now if there was, there was a price, it already has been paid on the cross. And the Holy Spirit was given to you and I, not as just a bonus or a uh, luxury Christianity. This is the only Christianity Christ offers to us. At the day of your salvation, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you, not after you paid a price. Now it is true that we do have to do things to cultivate the relationship, but don't get me wrong. That payment or that thing that you sacrifice to cultivate a relationship is not to you paying a price. If a husband comes to me and says, I had to pay to have sex with my wife, he doesn't have a wife, he has a prostitute. If you have to pay for intimacy, you're not in a relationship. Now every husband does know if you want to have intimacy, you have to cultivate it. So you can't come in from work ignoring your wife in the wedding and say, hey, I want it. You're not going to get it, home slice. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. In order to have intimacy, you have to cultivate a relationship. But no man goes about saying, well, I had to pay for sex or I had to pay for intimacy. No, you had to honor the relationship and the intimacy came as benefit. But nobody pays for that. Relationship with Holy Spirit, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to remove the traditional thinking, which people who teach that, you find out one thing. They're always praying for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, always expecting the gifts of the Holy Spirit and those gifts are not functioning because it's the teaching the basics of it is wrong that's why it's called the gifts if the holy spirit power if healing word of knowledge if being led by the holy spirit hearing his voice hearing his promptings having his empowerment having the strength to overcome temptation if these things are a payment they wouldn't be called gifts they will be called awards reward certificates no wonder why one of the churches in the new testament that was most gifted was the church of Corinth and if you read the, the epistle to Corinth you think he's writing apostle Paul is writing to a bunch of heathens these guys that such a immorality such a selfishness and carnality yet they were very functioning in the gifts of the Holy Spirit that indicates to us that the gifts are not forms of payment People think if I just learn to pray more, deeper more, if I just abandon every fleshly thing that I'm ever engaged in and then I will have the gifts. They won't be gifts, they will be rewards. Yes. 
you do have to pay a price or you do have to cultivate a relationship to develop that relationship but his gifts are gifts holy spirit is not an option to christian life holy spirit is the necessity you can't be a christian without the holy spirit now how far you go with the holy spirit how you cultivate that relationship totally depends on you and i i love book of ephesians in ephesians chapter one apostle paul says that you are sealed with holy spirit till the day of redemption i show this on the youth service is that when i took the envelope and i sealed the envelope and um and i said that when you put a, something an address address and a stamp on the envelope this envelope will go all the way to the recipient and then the envelope will be open at the day of your salvation you are the envelope and the holy spirit comes inside of you god seals you with the holy spirit until when until the day of your redemption it means until the day of your going to heaven holy spirit is not going to leave you holy spirit is not going to abandon you that is your relationship with holy spirit he's with you i feel bad for him actually <laughs> because he's stuck with some of us because <laughs> some of us are really you know we think it's hard to love god it's hard to love you it's hard to love me it's not hard to love God who is perfect, always with you, doesn't do anything bad, always wishes the best. It's hard to love us because with our inconsistencies, with our mood swings, with periods and all of the other craziness that comes with us. It's hard to love us but I want you to see the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us and that is a relationship. Pay attention here. That is a relationship. Okay. Fellowship is a different game. Paul later on says don't grieve the Spirit. He says be filled with the Holy Spirit so relationship is let me put it like this it's when you get legally married you get legally married in the eyes of the law you are married that's relationship fellowship is when you and your spouse live in the same house because how many of you know you can be married legally and not even live together there are people in this room that you're you're still married legally but your spouse you don't even know where they are you've never seen them in the last six months or six years but you're still legally in the eyes of the law you're still legally married legally being relationship with holy spirit is when you have that legality he lives in you fellowship is when you are close to him fellowship is kind of like this when you are married together but there's a difference between married together and loving each other being in the same house living sleeping in the same bed and there's a sense of cultivating sense of intimacy sense of fellowship sense of joy sense of you love each other you look at each other's eyes you admire each other you look forward to be with each other that is the fellowship of the holy spirit that is the intimacy of the holy spirit every single christian has the holy spirit that's the relationship the holy spirit doesn't have every single christian that's the fellowship the fellowship is cultivating a relationship with the person you are forgive me for the lack of theological word you are married to the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is the one I am legally connected to but I have the choice today to foster cultivate that relationship ever since I got married I'm gonna tell you one thing my relationship with Holy Spirit changed I look at my wife and I treat the Holy Spirit like I would treat my wife and they both have similarities <laughs> both are emotional both need your attention uh, with both if you don't spend time for some time I've never feel guilty for not spending time my, with my wife but I do begin to miss her I always felt guilty for not praying until I got married and one day God convicted me when I wouldn't like pray for a few days or I didn't read the Bible and the Holy Spirit said why is that when you don't spend time with your wife or you're out on a trip you don't walk around beat yourself down but you do miss her why is that you feel guilty if you didn't spend time with me I want you to feel hungry I want you to miss me I want you not to develop guilt he says I never intended a relationship me, me and you to be another thing that you do I meant it to be a relationship and when I started to see the Holy Spirit as a person that loves me and that I love him and if I go for a day or two three God forbid maybe a week of not talking or praying my relationship with him didn't end but I begin to feel that I miss that before that I would feel guilt I would feel shame I would feel like he doesn't want me he, he it's, it's over I mean we're divorced because I didn't talk to him for a few days and the devil would use that to push me even further from him but I realized if me and my wife do not see each other for a week and I'm gone on a trip and we still miss each other God wants the same thing to be done with the Holy Spirit come on somebody 
I'm not saying that you should have an excuse. I'm not saying that you should allow yourself on purpose, but at the same time, as a Christian, don't feel guilty for not reading your Bible. Feel hungry. Don't feel guilty for not, maybe not praying to two days, for the last two days or three days, but you should begin to feel hungry. Sometimes I encourage people even to take a break for a few days. You know, I don't pray on Saturdays. I give God rest. It's a day of rest for God. The Bible says the first rest, God rested, <laughs> not Adam. And so, I, forgive me, I'm still growing in my relationship with God. But I did tell Jesus, I said, Jesus, tomorrow, I mean, I'm going to be thinking about you. I will be reading your word, but I won't be talking. Why? I want to give you a break. Every day you get two hours of me. I'm pretty sure afterwards you need a rest. And so, uh, on, on Saturday, Jesus, you take a rest. My relationship with the Lord really started to change. When I learned how to cultivate a relationship with another human being in a very intimate way. I learned how you can offend someone by sometimes doing something very foolish and how the other person can still love you in spite of your imperfections and if that could happen with my wife I sure know the Holy Spirit is better than her and he is better and he is more understanding he's more patient and he is more loving. Amen. And so today we're going to jump in talking about this person, the Holy Spirit and relationship with Him. If you have your Bible or an iPhone, Android, iPad or any other device that has a Bible. How many of you, you no longer read physical Bible? Wave, raise your hand. How many of you don't read the Bible at all? <laughs> don't, don't your hand. <laughs> okay, so how many of you, you read always physical Bible? Physical Bible, not an app. Okay, very well, very well. Okay, well open your physical Bible please. You have one right in front of your pew. I would highly encourage you to read this whole chapter on your own but right now we're gonna go ahead and read just a few verses. Uh, Genesis 24 verse 1 until verse 4. Abraham was now very old and the Lord blessed him in every way. He said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all he had, put your hand under my tie. I want you to swear by the Lord the God of heaven and the God of the earth that you will not get a wife for my son from daughters of the Canaans among whom I am living but you will go to my country my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. A lot of theologians and people who study the Bible for living and learn Greek and, and all of the all of the stuff they said that this is one of the examples in the Old Testament a beautiful picture of the person of the Holy Spirit. Abraham speaks of God the Father. Isaac speaks of God the Son who was sacrificed for the sins of the world. And the unnamed servant, I want you to notice that this servant in here was not named. The Bible calls it the senior servant. And the fascinating part is that he had all the wealth of the father and the son under his command. The wealth of Abraham was not being managed by Isaac. It was managed by a senior servant whose name we don't know. And this reveals the person of the Holy Spirit who always seeks to be anonymous, doesn't draw attention to himself and who rules the wealth of heaven. Jesus said in in Gospel of John, he says everything that God has the Father has given to me and the Spirit will take what is mine and give it to you. Jesus does not manage wealth of heaven that is given to the Holy Spirit. So if you want anything from heaven, if you want anything from God, you cannot get it without going through the Holy Spirit. He is the ruler of the household of God. He is like the Joseph when Pharaoh was leading the Egypt but Joseph was running the Egypt and when Egyptians came to Pharaoh and said we are dying out of famine he says go to Joseph and Joseph opened the storehouses and began to feed them. The Holy Spirit is my Joseph. The Holy Spirit is your Joseph. Not only gifts but anything that has to do with God, anything that comes to receiving from God will have to go through the Holy Spirit. He is the ruler of heaven's wealth. He is the distributor of heaven's riches. He is the one that closes the gate and opens the gate and there is nothing you can do without him. When Israel offended and the Bible says vexed his spirit, God became their enemy. 
when Jesus would cast out demons by the Holy Spirit and Pharisees blasphemed him and he says you can trash me you can trash daddy but if you trash him he says it's over for you God the Father and God the Son has elevated and has this deep respect for the Spirit who doesn't seek attention for himself. That's why they put attention on him because he always brings attention to the Father. He brings attention to the Son and God the Father, God the Son brings attention to him. Amen. Amen. And so I want you to update your thinking right away that if you want to have access to anything that heaven offers, you got to be friends with the Spirit. You got to be friends with the Holy Spirit. So we mentioned Abraham is like the father, Isaac is like the son, the unnamed servant is like the Holy Spirit, Rebecca is like the bride, Laban is like the world. And so let's begin. The first thing that I want you to remember is this, he is thirsty. The unnamed servant was sent to find a wife for Isaac. It was one of those days where you know Isaac wasn't looking for his own wife. So I've had 16 ways, I had a sermon on preparing how to find a wife, Bible, biblical way. And so one of the biblical ways is get a servant and let him go find it for you. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just, I'm amazed at those days, how people lived. And so uh, it's very, very, very powerful, very deep prophetic. Anyway, but how you, you let someone go and find you a bride and bring you a bride. There's no text messages, you know, you couldn't FaceTime with her first, Skype her, you know, stalk her on Facebook, Google her pictures. I mean, no evidence. You don't even know how she looks. And the servant was responsible. He knew the taste of the son. He knew his preferences. He knew what he liked. He went to look for a bride for Isaac without Isaac by himself and he went to prepare that bride and bring her back to Isaac and that is the mission of the Holy Spirit he came on this earth to find a bride for Jesus and to prepare her be with her all the way until she meets Jesus at the wedding feast in heaven I love how Christianity is not presented as a funeral but as a feast Christianity is a marriage it's not a divorce it's not a fight it's a union between God and the first encounter this servant has with Rebecca this is what he says, I am thirsty. Now, if Rebecca would have been one of the girls today who watches too much Oprah, she would be like, well, get it yourself. You want water? You got hands and there is a well. You go do it yourself. But Rebecca, her femininity was fully developed without all of the extra stuff that gets attached today. Rebecca says, awesome. And she got him water. Now he had 10 camels, probably 10 or 15 servants with him. Imagine a girl looking at a guy who's asking for water and his servants are standing there and she's good looking. She's a virgin. She could say, me? No, I did my nails today. I did my facial. Don't you see it? My dress is brand new. I ain't gonna lift my, put anything there. That's, you go get it yourself. Plus you got servants for what? What are they standing for? But she wasn't like that. I want you to remember this. His thirst is your test. How was he testing her? By pretending to be thirsty. By pretending like no one else can satisfy his thirst but her. Holy Spirit is thirsty. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't want even your time. He wants your attention and your affection. Holy Spirit. No wonder when Jesus met a woman, he didn't give her water. He asked her for water. No wonder why in the epistles it says he yearns jealously. He has a desire. Holy Spirit doesn't need me, but he wants me. He waits to be wanted. He desires to be desired. He longs to be welcomed. And he desperately wants to be hosted. The Holy Spirit is a person who wants a drink from you. He wants your focus, your attention. He wants you to give him your affection. And the first test that your test is will you excuse yourself and say i'm busy that's not for me i'm not good enough for this 
or let someone else do it that's not fellowship of the Holy Spirit I'm not having a job of a pastor where I need to take time throughout the day and fellowship with Holy Spirit I don't even know how much and what kind of water he wants and you can come up with all of these lame excuses or you can be like Rebecca go into the well draw some water and say yes sir and give him water what I mean by fellowship with Holy Spirit is that you take time throughout your day and you talk to the Holy Spirit you can't walk in the Holy Spirit if you don't talk to the Holy Spirit remember that and the more you talk to the Holy Spirit the more you'll walk in the Holy Spirit and secondly the more you talk to the Holy Spirit less you'll talk to other people that offends the Holy Spirit because a lot of times we find ourselves the way we talk to other people and afterwards you walk out from that conversation you realize you either said too much too little or you said stuff that you should have not said you're like man if I would have kept my mouth shut the Holy Spirit would have been happy but because I opened that mouth and everything started coming out of it and you feel grieved the more you talk to the Holy Spirit you will find this out you will begin to talk less in a way that offends the Holy Spirit how do you do that the best way to do that is to take time throughout the day few minutes there and there few moments there and there where you address the Holy Spirit directly consciously with the flame of affection and your thoughts and your emotions connected not just like you know uh, Holy Spirit give me your grace and mercy uh, the word grace and mercy you don't even know what that means don't say those words if you have no comprehension of what they mean speak that comes from the inside we're not talking about hey what's up your Holy Spirit let's go to Burger King what do you like a whopper or, or you like the double cheeseburger not that you're not being respectful but consciously from the depth of your heart you know what you're talking about but you're addressing the person of the Holy Spirit for me how it started is that I would take time during prayer to begin to address the Holy Spirit talk to the Holy Spirit worship the Holy Spirit because he is God admire and just honor begin to say who he is how much he means to me and how much I need him but then it started to happen to where throughout the day when I would wake up in the morning and I try to every morning when I wake up I try to address him first sometimes in my thought and sometimes actually physically in my words where I say Holy Spirit thank you Holy Spirit this is good it's going to be a good morning it's going to be a good day and throughout the day to take time whether in the car in the shower where I have few moments of interaction with the Holy Spirit where I talk to him it doesn't it's not prayer it's fellowship I don't pray to my wife but I fellowship with my wife Holy Spirit doesn't want you to pray to him he wants you to fellowship with him so take time to talk to him he says give me a drink means give me some of your time see many of us are like Mary and Martha we invite the Holy Spirit in at the day of our salvation like Martha did she invites Jesus in and then Martha leaves the Jesus and goes in making sandwiches that he didn't order and then she gets so frustrated with the sandwiches because you know something is wrong with the stove and so she's worried she comes and she says Jesus send Mary to help me in my frustration and Jesus says Martha Martha you are worried and troubled about many things but only one thing is needed and Mary has chosen that thing see we all have a Martha and Mary inside of us the Martha that wants to do and Mary that wants to sit and be at the feet of Jesus and I want you to learn to calm your Martha down and make it be Mary at the feet of Jesus don't think that just because you invited the Holy Spirit inside that you can just dump him in the corner and let him watch Netflix the Holy Spirit needs to be hosted you can't you won't even do that to a human being I mean most of us treat dogs better when we come into the house the dog comes in you you pat it for just a few seconds few minutes you hey how you doing you're doing good that, 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 that thing you can't even talk back to you but you're talking to it talk to the Holy Spirit you come into the house you get into the car or you get into you get in away or you're driving somewhere long and you finish listening all of your music take time take few moments he is asking I am thirsty give me a drink Holy Spirit is far more interested in your passion than even your purity she was a virgin but it's not what caused her to be a bride what caused her to be a bride is that she was giving the water to the servant now sometimes we start that fellowship and we, we are conscious of that because we heard a sermon and we read the book and we get so pumped and excited and then a week or two weeks later we just drop it we, can, we almost like forget Holy Spirit exists we just forget and then what happens is people just afterwards give up and they feel guilty and they completely throw the thing and say you know what I've tried I want to teach you something that has been really helpful to me don't be so hard on yourself and don't take yourself too seriously one of our biggest problems that hinders our relationship with Holy Spirit is when you become so obsessed with yourself if you forgot maybe it's been months you haven't talked to him uh, get over yourself 
and start talking again. Oh, but what would he say? What about me? It's not about you. When the 10 spies too focused on, we were grasshopper. Shut up. Why are you even looking at yourself? Comparing yourself. It's not, never been about you or the giants. It's always been about God. I noticed one thing is that sometimes we have these sprouts with these spiritual highs and then we hit the spiritual lows. And when I was younger, I would always pray that I avoid spiritual lows. I looked for book how to avoid spiritual lows. I would, because I want to stay in spiritual high and go higher because from glory to glory and everything. But even Jesus had a great spiritual high and then went for 40 days being tempted and tormented by the devil. 40 days. And the next time he had another spiritual low, it only lasted three days and then he rose from the dead. My goal that I realized is this, is to make my spiritual lows shorter and higher. But I can't avoid spiritual lows. I will always have spiritual, I will have spiritual highs and I will have spiritual lows. And some of you who walk in is like, well, I am always, always, legally, yes, I'm always with God. But emotionally, mentally, there are times where I get so low or sometimes don't even want to read the Bible, don't even want to talk to the Holy Spirit, just kind of like you get in your own thing, your mind is somewhere else and it's fine. God sees that, God understands that. As long as you don't build an apartment there and move into that place, but you get out from that and next time you hope that it's shorter, and a little bit higher so you don't stop reading the bible but you at least you read few verses so you don't stop praying for two months but you just maybe don't pray for two days so a little bit higher it's like budget jumping you know bungee jumping you go in you jump but you don't hit the rocks see some of us when you get spiritual low you splash your face in everything you like get suicidal you quit on everything you block everybody you're going to this like bipolar episode and stuff no no be like a bungee jumping where if you had a spiritual low and you will feel that something is happening that evil day is coming you say you know what let it ride the way but hey this i can't go lower than this that's it i pick myself up and everything will be fine can somebody say amen, amen. number two if you water the camels you will wear the jewelry so not only she gives him the water, this woman is amazing. After she gives him the water, he drinks, picture this, 10 camels that can drink from 140 to 250 gallons each. Okay, and no, there's no hose where you can hold right into their mouth. So you have to go into the well, draw with a bucket. Now, uh, some, of, some of us, if you ever carried water into a baptism pool before we changed the water heater, you understand that carrying water, buckets of water, is, it's, it's not one of those things. It's not doing, you know, yoga or, or some other things. This is not easy. It's hard. So here is servant standing right by the camels and this woman, listen to this, volunteers. So he asked her, give me water. He never asked her, water my camels because that would be insane. So she, after watering him, good looking girl, virgin, godly, awesome girl. She comes to him and says, hey, do you want me to water the camels? He's looking at her, oh my God. She's the woman of God. She's the one. <laughs> Gentlemen, if you're looking for a wife, she's willing to wash your car, your parents' car. She's the one, take her. Give her your bank account, your social security, everything. She is the one. She volunteers. She's insane. And honestly, with the moment, she little did she know, the camel she was watering carried gifts that she's going to wear. She wasn't asking for the gifts. She was asking for a job. I wonder what would happen if... Uh, if we get more busy doing what we can the Holy Spirit will begin to add what we cannot he gave her the gifts the jewelry after she watered the camels that carried that jewelry many times we as Pentecostals charismatics we are guilty of chasing just the gifts instead of the person of the Holy Spirit and the person and the purpose of the Holy Spirit and that is to to serve the people the gifts aren't given to show off the gifts excuse me, the gifts are given in the first place so that we can serve with them and if you and I do not have the ability to serve in the things today that you can for example it's not hard to to vacuum 
it's not hard to install you know a toilet for some for some men who are very good at that it's not hard to rake leaves it's not hard to pick up paper it's not hard to greet people and when we right away not serving in at all we don't allow ourselves to be servants and we only are the people who want to wear gifts you have to understand those gifts they don't become for helping us serve they actually serve our pride and pride is worse than any sin ever committed on earth because it turns a Lucifer into Satan and the way we cure that is we constantly develop and maintain a heart of serving you know a guy who's not here with us today Sam um, because of uh, staying with his wife they're praying we're praying for their family and uh, I knew Sam from very long ago when he was still a director at Jubilee Center and uh, he came once and spoke here on our church in our church in one of our youth services and then they, st they started to come to church and um, and I remember when Sam decided to start coming here every week and started to get involved he says pastor I'm here to serve and so and I said great I knew he's a phenomenal speaker he gets up when he speaks right away a lot of people really say hey I really could connect with him he's a really nice guy smiles all the time and everything he said no I want to help and serve I want to guard I want to be the wall on the back over there with the brothers protecting the anointing and God's grace one of these days uh, one of the uh, pastors think Ilya was was gone and so I asked Sam I said could you please help me and and uh, do a word for offering he said he said Vlad no 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 he says I want to serve he says let one of the younger people do it I found the pastor that he used to go to church at and I asked him you know what was he doing in the church he says he was mowing the lawn for three years he had his own church in, in Texas and I'm like him mowing the lawn I'm like was that like some kind of a test he said no he says he was just seeking a need and just fulfilling it the interesting part is if you ask Sam you'll find out in the last few months there's more healings that have been happening during his work when he prays for people than most of us experience in our three lives see if you think that if somebody doesn't give you a microphone in a church or a position that demands the anointing to be expressed on everyone and that's the only way the anointing will flow through you that's not true there was a guy named Stephen in the Bible in the New Testament and when apostles they they were too busy handling all of the kitchen stuff and other things they've chosen these guys who would run the kitchen and the qualifications for them had to be full of the Holy Spirit full of faith good reputation it's like they were choosing apostles these guys were only in charge of the kitchen and I love that because in God's kingdom the lowest positions require the best people see most of us think well you know I'm better than this what you're seeing is that just because that position doesn't require holding a microphone that you can just toss anybody well I have education and I need to be more seen and there's nothing wrong with that there's a time and place for all of that but we have to get rid of this mindset that somehow if a position doesn't get me on a Facebook page or doesn't get me on the website that position is not important and I'm too high for that if you're too big for the towel you're too small for the throne and it's amazing because they anoint Stephen and Stephen was a phenomenal preacher. I mean Peter's sermon was very short and to the point and kind of mean. Stephen had this long sermon in book of Acts. The longest sermon recorded. Stephen, he would debate. People would get healed. Revival would happen. Yet in the church, Stephen would be in charge of the kitchen. It's amazing. Stephen still ended up in the history though he wasn't on a platform. I want to tell you something never limit the influence of the Holy Spirit to a platform you get in the church it's more important than that what's important is the Holy Spirit and the relationship with him and there are times when you begin to move in that and there will be a time where your own platform will be bigger than the platform in the church amen, amen. and God will promote you and God will lift you up but God is looking at your heart are you willing to water the camel which camels are you watering today name me 10 people you are feeding and watering today name me 10, 10 people you are influencing and discipling today which camel is receiving water from your resources which person is being blessed by your revelation which person is being fed encouraged and strengthened by the things that God is revealing to you find your camels and water them and you will be surprised how the gifts of the Holy Spirit will begin to be more active and be more accurate and you will get up and yeah you might not have the opportunity to speak at some kind of a conference but the activity of the Holy Spirit in your life is no less and sometimes even greater than somebody who goes in and speaks at some kind of a big conference because just because somebody has a big platform in the church it doesn't mean they have a big anointing from God amen so really want to challenge you water the camels and you will wear jewelry and number three 
His gifts beautify. His gifts beautify. When he gave her the gifts, these gifts made her look better. Now gifts of the Holy Spirit are not toys, they're tools, they're not jewelry, they are, they are tools. But at the same time there's a very beautiful component here that is very worthy to note is the gifts of the Holy Spirit are meant to beautify the church. Church without the gifts is like a woman without makeup. <laughs> I did not plan to say that. <laughs> Ah. it's natural but not supernatural <laughs> it's good organic vintage but keep that between you and yourself at home anyway let's go to first corinthians uh, chapter 12 verse 4 and 7 it says the following there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit so i want you to see gifts and the spirit there are differences of ministries but the same Lord so ministries and Lord so Jesus brings ministries and then we see next there are diversities of activities another translation says operations but the same God who works all in all so I want you to notice three things gifts of the Father are operational gifts of Jesus are ministry and gifts of the Holy Spirit are spiritual so gifts of the Father what is the gifts of the Father it's the natural abilities we are born with every single human being has gifts of the father god the father gives his gifts to every person who's born that's why we see people in leadership positions we see people who create uh like they invent light bulb we see you know like steve jobs he has a gift of the father if we look at them we're like oh these people run on their own gifts <laughs> nobody got anything on their own okay god the father puts these gifts in people and every human being has these gifts we all have different gifts and some of us develop them to a different different uh, way or different um we utilize them differently but at the same time every gift of humanity that we see on this earth is actually a gift of the father gift of jesus is the gift of ministry so it's the office of pastor teacher apostle prophet and uh, evangelist that's the gifts of jesus and these are the gifts that have been well most of them have been welcomed by the church the gift especially the pastor the evangelist and the teacher have been embraced in the church the apostle and the prophet not so much a lot of people really just kind of well prophets they're gone and apostles they're gone and so we just need the pastor the teacher and the evangelist but that is the furthest thing from the truth because the same way we need a pastor we need a prophet and the same way we need an apostle that's why one of the reasons why when people come to our church like apostle janshi oh man some people can't swallow that because it was it was wise men they couldn't swallow the wise men and so at least why was it wise men the bible says wise man built his house on the rock wise man harry built his life on jesus and that's why he's a wise man it's biblical scriptural but the bible says apostles there are people that god calls into the ministry of apostles the new testament was written by apostles the old testament was written by prophets these two ministries are the most ridiculed made fun of and mocked but these are two foundational ministries of the church amen and so that's why even when Shepherd Bushiri or, or uh, Prophet T.B. Joshua or other prophets, they're bigger and they're minor prophets, they come in and we allow them and bring them in on purpose in our church and we follow these guys, allow them to mentor us and speak into our life. Why? It's because these are very important ministries in the church today. The ministry, the gifts of Jesus. But the third one is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And Apostle Paul mentions nine of these gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to notice what would happen on the earth today if the gifts of the Father wouldn't be embraced, utilized and welcomed. You wouldn't have a sewer in your house. You wouldn't have a house, you will live in a hut. I can describe to you how the world looks without the gifts of the Father being developed. It's when you live in a hut, elephants pass you by, you don't have running water, because you live you're stuck in the stone age it's the gifts of the father that caused us today to have a building people develop these gifts they develop light they develop running water they develop the sewer system they develop the telecom system they develop the internet they develop they keep developing and developing and developing our world today is different because gifts of the father by the world has been appreciated embraced and developed the same thing happens in the church when the gifts of Jesus are not embraced and they're not utilized and they're not developed and they're not honored the church begins to struggle and we live 
alive but in the hut if the gifts of the Holy Spirit are treated the same way next thing that happens is we become people who live spiritually in the hut technologically we are advanced but you go to some of these African countries and they don't have anything in their services but every person will raise the dead but every person they can they can tell you what it's like to walk on the water they'll tell you what it's like when they multiplied that piece of meat and it fed the whole village they can tell you how they didn't lead one person or 70 people to Jesus in 70 days but how they led a hundred people in one day and you see that we're living spiritually in the hut but they're living physically in the hut they have utilized the gifts of the Holy Spirit and we have only allowed actually not we it's the world that have allowed and utilized the gifts of the Father we're just benefiting from it gifts of the Holy Spirit are as important as the gifts of the Father and the gifts of the Son a few things that I just wanted to uh, mention is that there's a big commotion we had a family that came last Sunday and they talked to us they go to a, a wonderful church but there is a sector in Christianity that believes the gifts of the Holy Spirit, all the miracles, ended when the apostles died. They actually have a pretty interesting argument. Their argument is the reason why God healed the sick, cast out demons is because he needed to write the book. And after he finished writing the book, the New Testament, he ended the miracles because they are no longer necessary. Now we have the book. It's amazing because I've never found a scripture in the Bible where Jesus says, the reason why I'm healing you is because I need to write a book. Never once. He, Bible says multitudes came, lepers came in and he said this one word kept saying, kept repeating, compassion. You never see, he said, I need to finish writing a New Testament, that's why I'm healing you. But if it wouldn't be for the New Testament, honestly, I, I care less about your leprosy. Jesus is still compassionate. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. He did not change. You know the only place where we have these ideas that we don't need the gifts of the Holy Spirit and they ended with the Apostles. The only place this teaching fosters and grows is in Western countries. Outside of America, outside of Europe, you go to India, you go to Russia, you go to China, you go to Mexico, you go to Latin America, you go to, to Africa, you go in those countries and you will find one thing. Even Presbyterians, even Baptists, even Catholics, they do all the same thing. They heal the sick, they cast out demons and believe for the supernatural. The only place where this teaching fosters and grows is in America. Why? Because we do all we can to do as much as we can without God. That's why when Chinese Christians visited America and they had a meeting with Billy Graham and Billy Graham asked them, so what is your impression of the American Christianity? And they said, we are amazed with how much you guys can do without God. And that's a really our goal. Our goal is to do as much as we can so we don't have to rely. Because see, when God comes in, sometimes you have to wait for Him. Sometimes you have to change things. You have to pray. You have to fast. You have to realign your life. But if you can make your life in such a way where He fits into whatever you wanted to do, in your own tradition, in how you grew up and how you were taught, He becomes unnecessary. And then, of course, you need to create a theory to justify that so that people don't ask questions. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, not only they are important, they're needed, Anytime we talk about miracles, there's always somebody who says things like, well, what about the false miracles? What about the miracles? The Bible says if you hear in the last days, people will do miracles and people will be false teachers and false prophets. I want you to remember this. When Jesus was tempted by the devil, he said this to Satan. Get behind me. Another translation says, follow me. Listen to this very carefully. Every place where Jesus is, there will always be counterfeit because Jesus told the devil to do that. He told the devil twice, follow behind me. Means anywhere the gospel comes in, there will always have to be a false gospel to follow. That's why there's antichrist. He will follow after the Christ. There will be false teachers. Why is false coming on the scene? Because there's something real. That's normal. It has to happen. The only reason false is gonna show up because there has been a presence of the real and to make fun of the real, avoid the real, not embrace the real, not seek the real, but be afraid of the false. Don't be afraid of the false. There will be no false if you don't have the real. He said, follow after me. That's why you see when the gospel was preached, right away some weird gospels will start circulating, being created and started to infiltrate the Christianity and start attacking. That is normal. You may say, but I don't like that. Get used to it. We have to overcome that. We are not afraid of the false. Satan used the scriptures 
Well, does that mean that we're all afraid of the scriptures? No. There's false teachers today. Does that mean we're afraid of the teachers? There's today false tongues. If you ever watch the ministry of T.B. Joshua, a lot of others, the demons start speaking in tongues. Well, does that, does that mean you're afraid of speaking in tongues? No. There are people today who are psychics and who can read your mail and everything. Does that mean that you're afraid of the word of knowledge and the gift of prophecy? No. It just means that we, you and I, need to get deeper and deeper into the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That those people, they literally are uh, like the magicians of Egypt. They say, you know what, this is the finger of God and whatever we're doing, we run out of tricks. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And lastly, that I would mention about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, one of the things that I've seen, and this is huge about casting out of demons and healing. Um, talking to one family last Sunday and they mentioned, they came to their church and they said, hey, um, you know, we don't believe, our church doesn't believe in healings because they ended uh, with the apostles. But he said, do our church even pray for the sick people? They're like, oh yeah, we pray for the sick people. It's like, so why would we pray for the sick people if we believe God doesn't want to heal them? We're praying against the will of God. So here you are saying, Lord, you know, if it's your will, I accept cancer as your will. And then you're going and praying against God's will and then hired a doctor to try to get rid of God's will in your life. You're either, forgive me, bipolar or you're confused. You're, you're confusing yourself or people. Either it's, it is God's will and we do everything to get rid of it. Doctors, prayer, medicine, everything. Or it's not God's will. And you accept it and don't go to the doctor and die. And he asked them a second question. I said, do healings happen? And the pastor replied to this gentleman. He said, oh yeah, people, God heals people in our church. Though we pray for it, we don't believe in it, but God still heals people. He said, how come the church never hears about it? He says, oh, we, we don't ever want to show a testimony of healing. Because if people will mention who prayed for them, it will begin to glorify that person's name. So pastor preaching 40 minutes an hour doesn't glorify his name though he's preaching about Jesus. Worship team singing for 30 minutes doesn't glorify their, their name even though they're singing about Jesus. But somehow a healing that is done by Jesus but because it was prayed for someone else is going to glorify the person's name. Why don't we apply the same rule for worship and sermon? And just come for church and have nobody get up and just sit there, stare at the screen and play Jesus movie. I cannot tell you how many times we had a deliverance that happened in the service and we would have you know our brothers and sisters from other churches or some of my co-pastors uh, pastors who were my friends and they would see a casting out a demon manifesting right there and so we would you know come and pray for the person on the spot they're like no no no, no. we gotta hide it take this away to the room and I said what is this something illegal wrong why are we hiding it people can see it why because if you're doing this you're giving glory to the devil the devil wouldn't be manifesting if he's not in trouble he's not getting any credit here and so when we would receive, when we would pray for deliverance we would uh, one time we prayed for deliverance you know in the room and everything but on our services if a demon manifests in the service especially if it happens for the first time with that person we deal with that right on the spot and i have never once heard a person leave our service and said oh my god i seen demons manifest today i'm thinking about worshiping satan <laughs> you know what kids we're into the wrong religion because I saw Satan shake and bake today. I think he's very powerful. No, every person leaves with the fear of God and saying, oh my goodness, the devil is defeated. He's real. I don't want to sin. I want to serve Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen? Now it's true that people can get proud and everything and at the same time, but what our goal is, is the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the healings, the glory of God, to be my evident. That's one of the reasons you see the testimonies every single service. That's one of the reasons why what we do on the prayer line is we believe God's glory must be seen. Amen.